Hello everybody. Today I'm going to come to you with yet another question. I'm going to ask, how is a small biological microscope uh, like the one I'm holding in my hands here, similar to a transmission electron microscope, uh, which utilizes a very powerful electron beam to uh, look at specimens? And uh, think about it a little bit and watch the next lecture. everybody uh, we've gotten to the point in this course where we're talking about transmission electron microscopy and uh, the picture you have in front of you is a transmission electron micrograph of copper I've kind of cut my face out of this lecture this time because I have a lot of pictures that I, I want to be sure I just don't cut them out and I think most of you know uh, what I look like um, but what we have here is we have copper um, we have kind of two bits of information here. Uh, so we have our bright filled image and we have our diffraction pattern. And so uh, we take advantage of electron diffraction uh, a lot of times when we do transmission electron microscopy. And uh, using um, these two bits of information together, uh, we can learn a lot about material. And uh, the kind of the microstructural feature that was of great interest um, during this body of work. So this is from my own thesis from many, many years ago. Uh, I looked at hypervelocity impacts um, of impact craters, and I don't know why I had the micrograph disappear, but I had these impact craters, and I was uh, looking at uh, the microstructural features that evolved as a result of hypervelocity impact. Uh, this body of research is still done by uh, other people across the country, particularly NASA, and it has um, implications uh, for uh, spacecraft because there's a lot of space debris. And uh, one of the uh, most read uh, books uh, I read uh, during my thesis was a, a book called Orbital Debris, A Technical Assessment. And so this uh, has some, uh, um, I guess, direct impact, I guess, on uh, aerospace. Well, anyway, um, I was looking at the microstructural features that occurred in these hypervelocity impact craters, and the microstructural feature of interest is this. And uh, one thing I want to kind of point out is this is purely contrast-driven analysis. Even looking at a diffraction pattern in this instance is really just looking at the differences between black and white. And here we're looking at differences between black and white. Uh, cut, cut, kind of some other things I want to say, sorry for stuttering a little bit, um, hand-drawn micrographs, and my advisor was a stickler on stuff like that, so all my micrographs in the original state were a centimeter because I used 1 cm equals 1 over mag times 10 to the fourth micron as we uh, talked about with optical microscopy. So I have my handmade micrographs here. Um, this is a hand-developed picture and so we had a negative uh, that we then had to go put on a projection device and project the image off of our negative onto um, some photographic paper. And so there was kind of a double photographic uh, process that happened. Um, so we had a real camera that gave negatives, uh, none of this digital stuff we have today. And uh, CCD um, is, is pretty commonly used, and so is a CMOS image sensor. So both of those imaging technologies we've talked about before are, are currently used on uh, modern transmission electron micrographs. Uh, developing photography um, is something that, that grad students uh, generally don't do much of these days unless it's a personal hobby. Well, anyway, microstructural feature, these, uh, in the, these things called microbands is what they're called. Um, there are dislocation structures. The diffraction pattern here, I'm indicating a 15 uh, degree misorientation with the parent lattice. And that's kind of how you tell that this is indeed a microband. It's, it's this 15 degree uh, characteristic um, misorientation angle here. And uh, let's go to the next slide. So talking about how they're formed, um, you have some shear going on as a result of the hypervelocity impact we see in the craters. Uh, you start forming dislocations, okay? So we learned that very uh, young, very early on in our metallurgy uh, curriculum. 
um, that when you start bending metal into forming metal, uh, you, you, you start forming dislocations. Um, the hypervelocity aspect of this and the shock wave that occurs here um, creates kind of an order to these dislocations. I'm gonna explain this really, really fast without other figures. And we start having some ordering of the dislocations. Uh, we end up with these cultural loamer locks and secondary slip starts to form. So these dislocations start forming on the secondary slip planes um, instead of just one, 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 okay? And so this secondary slip um, is what then leads to the formation of the microbands characterized by this most orientation angle of 15 degrees. So hopefully that's a, a, quick, a quick explanation. Uh, making of the uh, specimens was very, very tedious. So again, we have uh, the different versions of impact craters. So we shot tungsten carbide into copper targets at different speeds. Um, I then had to extract material to look at uh, with a TEM. And I'm sharing this because I want to want to kind of convey uh, that the specimen preparation, extremely tedious, specimen size, very small. And so we're talking about disks on the order of uh, one to two mill, or sorry, two to three millimeters in diameter. And so here I'm kind of depicting three millimeters for this little square. Um, I cut out a small column of material. This was with a high precision diamond blade um, from different radii of the crater. So I'm showing just below the impact. I also took some radial specimens and it was not easy. Um, this is a hand-drawn schematic from my youth actually. Um, I then embedded the so-called crater material into epoxy. Um, and I used a steel ring uh, to kind of protect the, the material because it was actually copper. And then I cut very, very thin slivers, um, roughly 100 to 200 microns in thickness and actually thinned that down even further. And we'll talk a little bit more about specimen preparation techniques uh, for electron or transmission electron microscopy uh, before this uh, seg section of the course is done. Uh, throwing this in here at the beginning just to show that um, TEM, specimen prep, very tedious. Um, a lot of people detract from the power of TEM microanalysis and they detract from it because the sample size is so small. And so if you start doing things like uh, looking at dislocation density based on TEM micrographs, because if you remember the concept of the modified Hall-Petch equation, uh, where Hall-Petch equation is generally driven by um, grain size, you can add on a term to the Hall-Pinch equation to incorporate the strengthening effect of uh, dislocations and precipitates and anything else, okay? And particularly the dislocations, because really a TEM is the only thing that you can use to see dislocations, uh, maybe an AFM as well, but you need atomic resolution to actually see dislocations. Um, if you're making these claims about the strength of material based on a specimen that's this small, uh, sometimes people balk at that a little bit. So um, just be ready for that in uh, your careers and stuff like that. I myself have had many arguments with individuals and uh, they say you need a statistical data set. And it's kind of two different points of view. And uh, here's the analogy I tend to use. Okay, so if I walk up to a river and stick my hand in there and I catch a fish in then like five seconds, I'm going to say, man, this river's full of fish. Okay, well, uh, in a manufacturing environment and even some experimental environments and research, um, someone will tell you, no, there's not a lot of fish in there. You were just lucky. Okay, you got to try a hundred times. Okay, and uh, so these are kind of the arguments that you uh, get into sometimes with people uh, when you're doing this kind of tedious, kind of high precision microscopy, uh, like transmission electron microscopy. And uh, again, specimen size is very small. If I make 10 specimens, maybe one or two come out. So you have to almost be lucky sometimes to get a good specimen. And uh, so very, very hard to do. Um, I've, I've made specimens with, with various techniques um, for uh, transmission microscopy. Uh, kind of showing this slide again. And uh, we uh, talked about this when we looked at SEM, so electron microscopy history, so the big kind of breakthrough that led to some of this stuff uh, was de Broglie and 1924 kind of figured out the wave particle duality of the electron. We've gone through this derivation 
before. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, if you want to see the derivation, look back at the uh, SEM videos, the SEM lectures. Uh, but lambda equals h over mv, um, or lambda equals h over momentum. Okay, and this is probably the wrong subscript. It should have been a v. Yeah, maybe it's just the font. But this is momentum, and hopefully you guys have that ingrained in your brain right now. Uh, Max Knoll and Ernst Ruschka, 1931. Um, these guys were the electron research group, uh, the first electron image, and I often wondered where they were from. And uh, I, I found a display at a research center a, a little while ago um, that kind of told me uh, where it was from. So the first commercially available, uh, where they're from, sorry. The first commercially available TEM uh, was 1935. Uh, World War II stalled the development of SEM, and a lot of the electron optics used for an SEM uh, relied upon the television, basically. And we've kind of talked about Philo Farnsworth and that kind of thing. And uh, this is my statement, my claim to fame. I'll have it engraved on my gravestone, perhaps. Accelerating electrons to a column is the basis of electron microscopy. Kind of a lame statement. Maybe I'll find something better. Um, Here's the napkin that uh, Noel and Rushka used to design their TEM. Actually, I don't recall where I found this, and, I, and uh, but this is actually an early schematic of the of the uh, TEM, basically. And uh, here's me standing in front of an early TEM with our um, illustrious department chair. Uh, this is a research center down in Chihuahua, Mexico, and uh, so they have this on display. And this is directly related to uh, this, basically. So this is a Siemens um, TEM microscope. And so Nolan Ruschka were in Germany. Siemens is, of course, a, a German company. Um, at one point in time, I worked for a subsidiary of Siemens in my life. And uh, very interesting. And you can kind of see um, it's a little tall. I don't know if that's a good scale. And uh, anyway, so um, there is this display uh, text next to it. And so this is kind of cool. So it's a Siemens Elimskop 1A. And uh, so it's, it's basically saying these German scientists here, uh, Ruschka and Noll. So I learned that they were German by reading this. I, I, I never knew 100% for sure until I read this. Uh, and this was actually kind of cool because uh, this, this is basically the first commercially available transmission electron microscope. And they had a model apparently at NMSU, so up the road from UTEP. And then NMSU donated it to uh, these folks, this is SIMAV. Um, it's a Conocet Research uh, Center. Very, very cool, very, very awesome place. Um, I always am amazed at the history of uh, the characterization equipment we use. And it was really, really cool seeing an old one um, like this, and actually the first one. And it really doesn't look much different than the TEMs we use uh, today. Um, so Nolan Ruschka, German scientist. Uh, Siemens, the first company to make a uh, transmission electron microscope. And I um, want to kind of throw this out here right quick. TEMs are cool and they allow for the collecting of data and generated, of data generated in real space and reciprocal space. And I didn't use this terminology purposely when I talked about uh, the microbrand uh, image. Uh, again, this is a bright filled image. And uh, so this is real space and this is reciprocal space. And a reciprocal space is also called K space. And uh, we'll hear that time and time again. It becomes more pertinent when we talk about kind of the quantum explanation of X-ray diffraction. Uh, this is kind of cool. And uh, so learning how to interpret uh, these micrographs is very, very important. Again, this is all kind of hand developed. Um, these are dynamically recrystallized grains in copper. And uh, this again is from the same project related to hypervelocity impact. Um, I know that these rings here are telling me that they're dynamically recrystallized grains, uh, extremely polycrystalline, you see a bunch. And uh, I know a little bit about the process history, okay? So I know that the material was subjected to a lot of material flow. If you go back here, um, you can actually see it. You know, this used to be a solid block and here's the remnant of the crater at the bottom. Uh, we have this, these kind of petals that form at the top. And I've argued with people in my past and, and several people told me that it melts. No, it doesn't melt. This is a solid state deformation process. So the forming of these kind of petal looking things at the edge of the crater, and this is a cross section. So I cut it in half 
uh, on this plane here um, is all solid state material flow. And to facilitate solid state material flow, you need what? Dynamic recrystallization. Um, so we see these nice dynamically recrystallized grains. You can figure out the thickness of your specimen uh, by counting these fringes, and we'll get to that uh, later in this section. Um, but real space is your image. Uh, reciprocal space is your diffraction pattern. Reciprocal space also called K-space. Um, using real space and, re and reciprocal space is really, really important. Okay, so at the very, very beginning of the lecture, and I'm sorry for going back and forth so much, and hopefully you're not watching this lecture at, at double speed or something. Uh, but we used our reciprocal space information and the misorientation. If I draw a line here from the center of the, of the transmitted spot to here and the center of the transmitted spot to here, and this is a little blurry, so this might not be the best one to do it on. I measure the angle between the two and it's 15 degrees. Okay, that's how I identify this is a, a microband. And um, that's using reciprocal space in conjunction with real space to help in your characterization process. Okay, so we know a little bit about microbands. We know this 15 degree misorientation is a characteristic angle. So I know that these are microbands because the diffraction pattern tells me so. Um, similar thing here, I'm looking at these really small grains. I know it's polycrystalline. I know a little bit about the uh, material processing history I see this micrograph knowing that there was some material flow, dynamic recrystallization. So I'm using, uh, again, reciprocal space to help me interpret my real space image. Very, very important. Again, looking at differences in black and white. Very, very powerful is contrast. Almost yoda did it there, Yoda. All right, so this is a twin and uh, kind of, you know, my little schematic of a twin, it's a fault. So A, B, C, B, A, you kind of change your stacking sequence of your atoms. Uh, the other reason I know it's a twin and not, you know, a Sharpie mark or something or, or something else, some other kind of fault, is it makes roughly 90 degree angle. So my real space image, if I draw it out and I draw a line tangentially through my diffraction pattern here, I get roughly a 90 degree angle. And it's very, very important to kind of a lot, make sure the orientation of your diffraction pattern is a consistent with the orientation of your image or else doing analysis like this becomes really, really hard. And um, anyway, again, using reciprocal space in conjunction with real space to help interpret uh, what's going on, basically. Okay, using the two, inf two bits of information together, very, very powerful. It's also an image. So diffraction in this instance is image-based versus spectra-based. Okay, so um, a little bit different than XRD, all right? Uh, kind of looking at some real space images, and this is actually kind of cool. So this is off of RTEM in the department, and uh, we see uh, two grains actually. And so you, if you look here, you can see the atoms are oriented uh, in this direction, and we can actually calculate the misorientation angle between the two. Uh, and this, and they're, uh, the atoms are oriented this direction here. So these are actually two grains. Uh, and this is a grain boundary, and maybe there was some preferential etching or something like that. Uh, this was done at a facility uh, in Albuquerque called SINT, and uh, this uh, young young person uh, was on her PhD uh, dissertation back in 2015, and uh, she was doing thin film work, and she got some very beautiful TEM imaging, and uh, we have here some faults. Uh, we know they're not twins because the diffraction pattern is not making a 90 degree angle with them. So it's some other type of fault. Um, what's kind of cool is you see the interface between the silicon and the zinc telluride um, film. And you see here dislocations. And so in electronic materials, I, I kind of talk about how dislocations facilitate lattice mismatch. So dislocations are a good thing. Um, sometimes they're a bad thing, but sometimes they're a good thing. Um, this micrograph is super cool. You can kind of see a diffusion zone here. Um, what's really neat is SiO2 is, of course, amorphous. So we see amorphicity on a TEM micrograph. So you can see the orderedness, if you will, of this CAD telluride and this germanium. You can actually see the rows of atoms, but here you see atoms, but there's no real order to them. So silicon dioxide, amorphous, uh, CAD telluride, crystalline, germanium, of course, crystalline. And uh, so this is really cool. Um, all seen with a TEM. I kind of circled off this little square to kind of give credit to Rizbe. Uh, 
uh, very, very talented uh, young person. Um, anywho, power of TEM, uh, real space images alone tell you some cool stuff. Real space images with reciprocal space diffraction patterns tell you even more stuff. It's, it's really cool. Seeing amorphicity with my eyes, that's really neat. And uh, crystal structure, dislocations. I mean, it's just really cool. I love, I love electron microscopy. It's, it's just awesome. Um, so similarities to scanning electron microscopy, you have an electron gun, you have a column, and it operates in a vacuum, very, very high vacuum. Similarities to optical microscopy, and I meant to have a picture here of a biological scope, but if you look at uh, this schematic that our textbook Brandon and Kaplan gives us, we have our electron gun, uh, different apertures where our specimen lives, uh, some other apertures and lenses actually, excuse me, magnetic lenses and our recording plane. So a TEM is basically just an inverted biological optical microscope. And in fact, the design of the TEM was based on a biological optical microscope because that's all these folks had to go on. Okay, so the sources at the, at the top in this instance uh, they're blasting the light through your specimen stage and you have two different uh, lenses and you have your recording plane. Uh, but think of a biological microscope. All right, through some creative editing, I've added in the uh, biological microscope so it's inverted. Um, so we have our light source. We have our some sort of condenser for the light if you want to use your imagination. Uh, we have where our specimen is. We have our objective lens and this final imaging system and observation and recording system so I can put a camera right here. So a TEM similar to an inverted uh, biological optical microscope, why? Because that's pretty much what the designers of a TEM had to go on. Uh, there are TEMs that illuminate going the other way and I, I always thought that was kind of strange. Uh, but anyway, people dare to be different, more power to them. Um, kind of a reminder, of uh, the electron guns. So we talk about the vacuum column and here's where the electron gun is on a TEM. And uh, let me get a laser pointer. Here's where the electron gun is on the TEM. Um, the electron guns, uh, tungsten hairpin filament, lab six tip and uh, field emission tip. Okay. And uh, just kind of a reminder, we talked, a, we talked a little bit more detail about electron guns on a scanning electron microscopy. Um, this is missing shot key, and I, I was realizing in my brain, I, I don't know if they actually make uh, shot key TEMs, and I, I, I'm almost thinking that no one does, And uh, but I challenge you to um, Google it and, and find out. So explore a little bit, see if, if uh, there's a shot key based uh, TEM, and um, I'm thinking there may not be, um, so anywho. Uh, just food for thought there. Um, I like this schematic, and I think this is a Hitachi or Joel. I, I, I don't remember. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's Hitachi. No, it's probably Joel. If you look really close, uh, you can see that that's a Joel microscope. So this is Joel. Um, so another big company, uh, Japan Electron Optics Lab, Joel. Uh, Hitachi is another one, FEI. Uh, another maker of TEMs. And um, I don't know if Tescan and, and Zeiss make TEMs, uh, to be honest with you, but I know for sure Japan Electron Optics Lab, Joel, Hitachi, and uh, FEI, which uh, was formerly Philips, uh, which I think Philips was actually owned by Siemens. So um, there's some history there. FEI, I think you're buying history if you buy an FEI, long, long heritage in electron microscopes. I may be wrong, but anyway, uh, conventional TEM, and I generally refer to these as biological TEMs. And actually biological TEMs tend to cut off at 100 kilovolts. And you can run biological TEMs at like 80 kilovolts. So it makes it uh, useful for polymeric specimens as well as uh, biological specimens, obviously, like tissue and stuff like that. But according to this slide, a conventional TEM is a 100 to 200 kilovolts. A high voltage TEM or intermediate, excuse me, intermediate high voltage TEM, according to this slide, is 300 to 500 kilovolts. So the TEM we have on campus uh, runs at an, a maximum uh, accelerating voltage of 300 kilovolts. Um, the chemistry department has a Joel, it's a cryo TEM, and it also operates at 300 kilovolts maximum accelerated potential. You can always run it lower. Um, ultra high voltage TEM 
a thousand kilovolts. That's pretty dang high. And uh, so this is a big one. So 1.3 uh, megavolts. Okay, so 1,000 kilovolts is a megavolt. And uh, the this is huge. Here's your observation area. And here's the gun. And it's like a nuclear reactor, I think, was the design, uh, really. Um, very interesting. I, I may want to look into that a little bit more. I don't think this is using a tungsten hairpin uh, in the electron gun. Uh, they have the, the scientists here um, as, as, uh, as a reference in terms of size. And so you can tell this is pretty big. And I used to have a picture and I've lost it. And I guess I could Google it and find it again of, of someone actually using one of these. Uh, very, very impressive. But they range in scale. Um, if you remember wavelength, uh, the higher the accelerating voltage, the shorter the wavelength, the shorter the wavelength, the smaller thing you can see. And I'll have a supplemental video for you to watch on uh, the basically the development of a very, very awesome TEM. Speaking of wavelength, so we're starting off, uh, we're calling SEM wavelength, okay? And uh, TEM wavelength um, is, is we kind of start again with de Broglie, just like uh, um, we did with SEM. And so we, give, we, we kind of start from the equation of the SEM wavelength. So EV equals uh, MV squared over two, so one half MV squared. Okay, so E is the charge of the electron. This V is the voltage. This is the velocity. And uh, M is the mass of the electron. And so um, V, if you recall, the speed equals the square root. I'm trying to do this without writing it, and it may be my folly. Um, is 2EV over M. Okay, so there's a direct proportionality. So it's a square root. But still, the bigger the voltage, the faster you're going to go. Okay, so the bigger the voltage, the faster you're going to go. And so we're operating at really, really high voltages. So if you go back and look here, we're always, in most cases, okay, at least, the very least, an order of magnitude higher voltage than a SEM. Okay, so SEMs typically peak out at 30 kilovolts. Um, TEMs generally start at around the 100 kilovolt, maybe 80 kilovolt, but you know, a little bit of hand waving, we're at least an order of magnitude, higher voltage. So we're gonna be a lot faster. So when you make the equation for the TEM wavelength now, you have to incorporate a relativistic term. So this two MC squared, uh, relative, or this whole thing, I guess, is a relativistic term. This is a lot of numbers to punch. And so um, you can write it in terms of lambda equals hc over the square root of voltage. The uh, units don't really cancel out. It's another one of, another one of those approximations. Uh, but lambda equals 12.4 over the square root of voltage, and that's in angstroms, OK? Um, simple approximation. You get pretty darn close. Uh, one thing I always want to draw people's attention to is within uh, Brandon and Kaplan, and did I copy that? by accident? No, I didn't. Okay. Within Brandon and Kaplan, this book is wrong. Okay. On page 185 within the text talking about TEM wavelength. If you go to the back and look at the uh, appendix, okay, relativistic electron wavelengths. Okay. So this means fast. So starting at about the 100 kilovolt range, we have to start incorporating this relativistic term, C celeritas. They probably shouldn't have used the big C, right? Um, anyway, this equation in the back of the book is right on page 521. So I always want to, want to draw your attention. And it's nice. They have a table, so you don't even have to work it out. So this actually is giving it to you in, uh, in nanometers. Um, be careful with units. Always this approximation is for angstroms. It's an old approximation, old, old folks like me, before the nanometer was invented. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, anyway. When we talked about the electron beam interaction for an SEM, this is what we cared about. So backscattered electrons, visible photons. We didn't really talk about visible photons all that much. Um, OJ electrons, secondary electrons, and X-rays. So this is generally what we care about. When we talk about a TEM now, we have a very, very thin specimen. So it's not like XRD in that sense, but it is like XRD when we talk about a diffracted beam. So we actually care about diffraction here. 
uh, transmitted electron beam. So the beam goes through the, the material, we get our image, diffracted electron beam, we get our diffraction pattern somewhere over here. Through the magic of electron optics, we can actually see diffraction patterns, and we'll talk about that. It's a series of apertures. Um, we'll talk about that when we look a little bit more deeper at uh, how the machine works. Um, kind of a little tidbit or kind of a little foray into how the machine works. We can look at this schematic, got this from my scope. Again, here's a column, Phillips. Uh, now I think they sell them under the FEI brand. Uh, FEI is field electron and ion, I believe is what FEI stands for. Maybe I should uh, make a little contest or something. I don't know. Um, it's, it's interesting. This schematic shows two condenser apertures. Um, so maybe adjusted by user depending on TEM type. So most TEMs I've worked with personally only have one adjustable condenser aperture and one objective aperture in the selected area. So it's cos, like cosine. So that's how you kind of remember the order of apertures, uh, condenser, objective, selected, uh, cosine. Um, your specimen goes here after your condenser aperture. So you condense the beam, blast through the specimen, hits your objected aperture, um, if you insert your selected area aperture, you're looking at a diffraction pattern. If you take your selected area aperture out, you're looking at your bright filled image. Okay. Um, what's really kind of cool and what we'll talk about it in more detail, you have a series of apertures. Okay. So when you take your selected area aperture out, you're going to look at the image generated by this beam. So this is bright filled. You can use your aperture to image this beam, and this would be dark filled. And we're gonna talk about it in a little bit more detail later. I just thought I'd throw that in there now. Um, you also give off x-rays, don't wanna forget that. Uh, so you can do EDS on a TEM. Uh, reciprocal lattice, okay? So basically this is the premise upon which uh, at least diffraction patterns work. Um, I oftentimes debate if I should talk about it on X-ray diffraction or save it for electron diffraction. And, and in most cases, I save it for electron diffraction. Um, but it's basically a, a construct to help us interpret diffraction patterns. And uh, so the reciprocal lattice lies in reciprocal space. I've said this before already. It's also known as K space uh, because this is the K vector. And uh, we'll, we'll see uh, a different way to describe Bragg's law uh, where we care about the K vector. So K space, reciprocal space, the same thing. This is your reciprocal lattice vector and here's your diffraction spot. Um, this is the incoming beam. Let's just say this is your specimen and this is the transmitted beam. Okay, kind of a poor schematic. Um, the Etwald sphere is the reflection sphere and uh, that's where diffraction patterns live on the Etwald sphere. And the uh, general radius of the Etwald sphere is one over lambda. Um, limiting radius is uh, basically the limit to diffraction. And this is a little incorrect. All right, some creative editing. Now it's correct. So if you remember, the limit to diffraction is half the wavelength. So the radius of our limiting sphere has to be half the wavelength, lambda over two, okay? And uh, very, very important, when the reciprocal lattice vector G intersects the diff diffracted K vector K, you, do, you get a diffraction spot. An angel gets its wings. No, you get a diffraction spot. And so again, this is the K vector. This is the reciprocal lattice vector denoted as G. It has different denotations depending on who wrote the text. I learned it as G. Um, I left K out of both of these diagrams. I apologize. Oh, there we go. Denote it as K or K. Okay, so K vector or K with a little squiggly line underneath. So this is the K vector. Okay, and, and again, when the K vector intersects the G vector, you get, a, you get a diffraction spot. So K vector, G vector. G vector is the reciprocal lattice vector. I'm saying a lot of things about vectors. Don't get them confused. Just know that when G intersects with K, you get a spot. We'll see it again. All right, so how do we construct reciprocal lattice space? Um, we're dealing with vectors. 
So we're, we're dealing with a reciprocal lattice vector and we're dealing with um, the K vector. So vectors um, are pretty much how we make this construct. And uh, the following explanation I, I got or I learned from reading Cullity, uh, the XRD book, and it applies here. And I know some of you have uh, access to a copy of Cullity's book. Um, if, if you find this uh, explanation a bit lacking, uh, feel free to look elsewhere. Um, but let's, let's move on. So basic vector stuff. So I have two angles A and B. I mean vectors A and vector B. Um, they're separated by angle alpha. And uh, so the dot product is AB cosine alpha. So the length of A times the length of B cosine alpha. Um, the cross product is AB sine alpha. And that happens to equal C, uh, which is another vector. So we have this resultant vector, C. So this is um, um, the cross product. And so vector C is perpendicular. So you have to keep in mind that this is going to make a plane. So vector C is perpendicular to this plane. Uh, how you calculate that plane is uh, simply by multiplying uh, the, the length of A times the length of B. So we're using a different notation here to get area. And uh, so C is a result of the cross product of A cross B, uh, which is AB sine alpha. And uh, area is, is found basically by multiplying the length of A times the length of B, as you would find the uh, area of any parallelogram, really. Um, so let's kind of change the notation a little bit. So up here we have ABC. Um, here we have A1, A2, and A3. Uh, to kind of more match uh, what we're going to what we're going to talk about in terms of um, reciprocal lattice, and so the area of this parallel parallelogram now we can calculate it from this product a1 uh, times a2. So the the length of a1 times the length of a2 gives us area. Um, if we look at real space and reciprocal space. Um, real space is defined by unit vectors, so we can say a1, a2, a3. Um, reciprocal space is defined by reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2, B3. You could also use the letter G. So you could say G1, G2, G3, as we've seen before, to define a reciprocal uh, lattice vector. Uh, we have these equations now um, defining our reciprocal lattice vectors. So if we take uh, this reciprocal lattice vector V1, um, it is the area um, defined by A2 and A3 divided by volume. Uh, B2 is defined by the plane made by A3 and A1, the area of the plane made by A3 and A1 divided by a volume. And B3 is the area of plane A1 and A2, or the plane made from A1 and A2 divided by a volume. Okay, so we go back A1, A2, A3, um, we can make different planes, okay? And they start to look like a cubic crystallographic structure if you think about it, right? So we have a plane made by A3 and A2, um, A3 and A2. Uh, we have a plane made by A3 and A1, so A3 and A1. And the leftover plane is A1 and A2. So this plane down here, our OG plane uh, that we, we, dis we discovered, OG, original gangsta, not... Uh, um, a line segment. Didn't mean to confuse. Um, anyway, question of the hour, V is volume. So where does this volume come from? Well, we've already said uh, that the area of a parallelogram can be calculated uh, by multiplying A1 times A2 here. All right, so now we have this plane uh, made by A1 and A2, and we can project it along uh, this vector a3 so we can say a3 dot um, this plane a1 and a2 okay so we can what does this make so this is a volume times a height okay so that's kind of cool so i'm sorry this is an area excuse me this is an area times a height well area times height equals volume so we can rewrite v in terms of a3 um, dot a1 a2 okay so the vector a3 um, basically multiplied by um, a1 and a2 and uh, you can't do this 
okay, you, you, this cancels out, right? These, uh, the area of this plane and this plane will cancel out. So B3 equals one over A3. And uh, that's pretty awesome actually, because this tells us that B3 really is the reciprocal of A3, okay? Uh, but the problem is you're not really allowed to divide by a vector. Uh, that's a, a mathematical no-no uh, from what I've been told by my mathematical friends. Um, so we have to look at it in a slightly different way and we can go back to old fashioned geometry and we can take this plane defined by four points. Um, this plane is OABC and so that's the area of plane OABC. Um, we, can, we can divide it now by a volume which is the area of OABC times the height OD here. So that's our volume, okay? And so uh, A1, A2 here is now defined by the area of OABC. Um, now our volume V is defined by the area of OABC multiplied by this value OD or this height OD. And that's basically where V comes from. Um, so OD is really equal to A3. They're both equal to the D spacing of the 0, 0, 001 plane. Well, that's quite interesting. So now we have our 0, 0, 001 plane. Um, if you want to start thinking about it by this convention, we can say, well, B3 is 1 over D001, B2 is 1 over D010, and B1 is 1 over D100. So if we take the dot products of these vectors, uh, B3 dot A2 equals 0, B3 dot A1 equals 0, but B3 dot A3 equals 1. And so we kind of have these rules then we observe. Um, bi uh, dot aj equals zero when i doesn't equal j, and bi dot aj equals one when i equals j. So when they're equal to one another, they're gonna equal one. When they're not equal to one another, they're gonna equal zero. This equaling zero and some other integer is uh, very, very important um, because if they're equal to zero, they're perpendicular to one another. And we'll see how this comes into play when we're looking at the zone axis criterion. Um, they're parallel to one another uh, when they equal to one. So this will come back to uh, kind of get us. Uh, I shouldn't say get us, we'll, we'll revisit it again, more positive and it's more true. We will revisit it again. All right, so now we see things that look like reciprocals. And so we're seeing that this is a reciprocal lattice vector and so that's kind of how reciprocal space is constructed. Uh, the biggest thing to kind of take away now is this is real space and this is reciprocal space. And real space and reciprocal space are, are perpendicular to each other. And uh, that's, we can only have diffraction patterns. And this kind of comes back into play when we're indexing if our reciprocal space is perpendicular to our real space. And uh, that's kind of the purpose of going through this kind of vector exercise. Uh, the question I just answered, what angle does reciprocal space make with real space? Well, it's 90 degrees. Why? Because they're perpendicular. Uh, reciprocal lattice vector now, let's talk a little bit more about it. Um, H sub HKL or H, uh, this is another notation for it, or G, which is the one I typically use typically use uh, G is perpendicular to real HKL or real space. Um, G equals H times this reciprocal lattice vector plus K times this reciprocal lattice vector plus L times this reciprocal lattice vector. Um, more succinctly, G equals one over D HKL. And we've, we've kind of seen this uh, back up here. So we could just substitute this for G and instead of having the um, Miller indice here, we could just say HKL. And hopefully uh, this uh, makes a reciprocal lattice and, and kind of our use of reciprocal lattice a bit understandable. Um, so again, this is what we kind of think about. We have our limiting sphere, sphere excuse me, uh, the radius is lambda over two. Um, our k vector is noted as, as k with a vector or k with a little squiggly. Reciprocal lattice vector is g. Um, hopefully we have a better understanding of where this construct comes from. It's just a vector construct uh, to help us interpret diffraction patterns, basically. Um, Etwald sphere. So Etwald sphere, 
is uh, this here. So this is really a sphere. And if you think about it, um, let me see if I can if I can do it as a pen. You kind of have these beams. Hey, you didn't pen it for me. Hold on. There you go. You have beams kind of coming out and they're kind of oblong shaped, right? And when we look at the diffraction pattern, we're actually looking at, um, let me change the ink here. Um, you're looking at a slice of a sphere, okay? And so if you notice, so we're actually looking at a slice. So when we look at a diffraction pattern, we're looking at a slice of, a, of, of this beam and we're looking at a cross section of a sphere. And so that's why sometimes these dots look kind of oblong. And uh, I think more modern machines have ways to correct that. Uh, but sometimes they don't look perfectly round because we're actually looking at a, at a section of this kind of curvy ray of, uh, I shouldn't say light, but beam of electrons. Hey everybody, um, what I was trying to explain on that last slide was that when you make a diffraction pattern, you have these diffracted beams, and I guess this one could kind of be the transmitted beam, but you're taking something that would be projected in a sphere and you're actually taking a slice of that sphere. And so you end up with dots of different diameters and sometimes they're kind of oblong. And it's kind of analogous to taking a world map on a globe and then making a flat world map and there's some kind of wackiness associated with that. Um, hopefully this uh, clears up what I was trying to depict on the last slide. Thank you. Um, so Edwald Spear, it's basically telling us where constructive interference occurs. And so I said, hey, when the K vector intersects the G vector, you get diffraction. So when K is equal to G, um, that's where uh, constructive interference is occurring. So let me get my mouse back. I lost it. It might be gone for good. So where you see these yellow stars, where you, where you see these yellow stars, got my pointer back, um, this is where a diffraction spot's going to occur. So where these stars are, are where k is equal to g, where your k vector is equal to your reciprocal lattice vector. Um, how do I manipulate? So if you look, if we're looking at a static system, okay, we're limited to what we're going to see really, right? And we're going to limit to what we're going to diffract. Um, so there are three ways to manipulate the Etwald sphere. Um, so you can change the wavelength, move the sample, or manipulate the detector and or source. And uh, this is more pertaining to XRD, uh, but there is some crossover between the concept of electron and, and uh, X-ray diffraction. Um, so if we change the wavelength of the Etwald sphere, if we have a smaller wavelength, okay, so lambda two is less than lambda one, lambda three is less than lambda two and also less than lambda one, and lambda four is the smallest of them all, we're actually making our Etwald sphere uh, bigger it's actually kind of cool. So we can actually see more with a smaller wavelength. And hopefully that is intuitive. If it's not, um, think really, really hard. So, um, so from a crystallographic point of view, can a TEM see more than an XRD? We'll go back and look at the wavelength um, earlier in this presentation and compare that wavelength to 1.54 angstroms. And that'll answer your question. Uh, move the sample. So um, this is where we were and this is where we are. So you can move your sample and we're actually changing which uh, dots interact with the sphere somewhat. So moving the sample is another way to uh, uh, manipulate your Etwald sphere and change what you're seeing or diffracting. And uh, moving um, the sample is how crystal allow rotating crystal works. And we talked a little bit about rotating crystal before where you spin the crystal on an axis and you have that photographic paper. Um, so you can refer back to X-ray diffraction if you uh, have forgotten what I'm talking about. All right, so um, the third way we talked about for manipulating the Etwald sphere is uh, moving the source or the detector. And you really can't do that on a TEM. Uh, the column is pretty static and your recording plane is also pretty static. And uh, in fact, I shouldn't say pretty static, it is static. So this is actually more for XRD. 
And uh, so, so this is actually happening when you run an XRD, you're moving typically the source and the detector. Uh, but this is a depiction of the effect of uh, the Etwald sphere. So each of these colored circles is uh, one position condition. And uh, I think we've talked about quite a bit in this lecture. And so I think this is a good place to stop. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And hopefully this has been informative to you. Thank you very much. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.